Jag kommer ju tala här också. Tack. Stänga av Skype och allt sånt där nu. Allt som, som kan ge notiser är avstängd nu. Mm, bak fick jag tror jag
vet egentligen om det. Så att, men det kan vara sådana här som man vet om det. Det är ju som två skådare tar till. Ja, det behöver inte vara helt... Um, hello, excuse me. I think time's running. Yes, that's a good signal. Please take your phone off on the airplane status, maybe, or quiet, please. Ladies and gentlemen, Member of Parliament, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the Swedish Parliament Riksdagen and the seminar People and Organization that Contribute to a Better World. I also want to welcome those of you who are following this seminar by webcasting. My name is Eva Lena Jansson. I'm a member of the Parliament representing the Social Democratic Party, but I'm also the chair of the committee of the group, support group for the Right Livelihood award in Swedish Parliament. Seven parties in, this, in Riksdagen are hosting the seminar today. We will soon have the privilege to take part of the knowledge and experience of the, this year's remarkable laureates. We have asked our friend, 
Ole von Yxkull, Exec Executive Director at the Bright Livelihood Award to be the guide and the moderate for this seminar. So warm welcome once more and please Ole, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Eva-Lena, and a very warm welcome to all of you to this seminar with the 2017 Right Livelihood Award laureates. And before we start, there are many people who are behind the seminar, obviously. I specifically want to thank you, Eva-Lena, and Sarla, the Society for the Right Livelihood Award in the Swedish Parliament. And I want to thank the seven party groups that are inviting us to this seminar. And with that, I have the pleasure to introduce our first laureate, who we are going to talk to, hopefully, over a Skype connection, Khadija Ismailova. Khadija is an investigative journalist from Azerbaijan. She receives the Right Livelihood Award this year for her courage and tenacity in exposing corruption at the highest levels of government through outstanding investigative journalism in the name of transparency and accountability. Khadija Ismailova is Azerbaijan's most outstanding contemporary investigative journalist. For publishing articles on government corruption, Ismailova has been subjected to smear campaigns, harassment and fabricated criminal charges. Despite serving one and a half years in prison, she has refused to be silenced. Ismailova also addresses Azerbaijan's poor human rights record, as the government continues to intimidate and jail journalists with an alarming frequency. Ismailova remains resolute in courageously writing and speaking out for greater government accountability and good governance. Khadisha Ismailova, Azerbaijan. So please join me in welcoming Khadija. Khadija, a uh, virtual welcome to you to the Swedish Parliament. The spot from which you are talking to us is a very honorable spot. We've had a number of laureates in recent years who could not attend the award ceremonies because they are banned from travel in different ways. And from yeah, where you're speaking to us now, for instance, Edward Snowden spoke to us in 2014. Thank you, you so much. Khadija, you always say that you don't want the attention on you as a person, but let me still start with the question to you. Can you explain our audience why you cannot be with us here today? Well, uh, I'm still convicted with illegal entrepreneurship uh, because I'm a journalist and I work for foreign media without accreditation in foreign ministries. That's the official reason why I'm uh, on the travel ban, but I'm not the only one. There are uh, about a dozen uh, other journalists who are on the travel ban, and uh, they are um, 
the government brings up different reasons and the main goal is to not let uh, work out of the country. But again, uh, this is not the biggest problem that we should talk about. We, ha we still have nine journalists in prison of, uh, prisons of Azerbaijan, at least nine journalists who are in prison. And uh, comparing to their situation, uh, me not being able to go somewhere is, uh, is not that important. Uh, so uh, I uh, appreciate and I want to thank everyone who pays attention and uh, advocates for our full freedom, full, uh, uh, but, uh, but I would kindly request, ask uh, all these people to uh, speak about, uh, on behalf of the journalists who cannot even join conferences via internet and uh, because they are in prison and because they're, they and their family members are endangered by the harassment of the government. Yesterday, we delivered a petition to the Azeri Embassy here in Stockholm, signed by 56 laureates of the Right Livelihood Award, where we also called upon the government to uh, end the restrictions facing many journalists. Also, in the run-up to the award presentation here in Stockholm today, the Swedish foreign minister has been taking up this problem of press freedom in Azerbaijan with her colleague, with her Azeri colleague, and even the Swedish Prime Minister mentioned this at a meeting in Brussels to President Aliyev on Friday. Does this kind of international pressure help, or can that even be dangerous for you in Azerbaijan? Well, uh, it, defi it definitely is helpful, uh, uh, although the government does not uh, seem to be listening to uh, it's, uh, but uh, the talks should follow by actions. And uh, uh, when uh, the international organizations, uh, the foreign diplomats or the foreign politicians are talking to my government about the harassment of journalists, about the, uh, the pressure on civil society, they should also say that uh, by, uh, continuing uh, limiting the space for free media in Azerbaijan or uh, continuing oppressing its own people, uh, the government loses their support and their welcome. And it's a shame that uh, those who are banning us from traveling are free to travel to European capitals. Uh, and in first place, it should be asked why Ilham Aliyev is welcome in Brussels and why Ilham Aliyev is being uh, welcomed by international politicians. Why do they talk to him uh, as a, like a uh, Swedish prime minister is giving his, uh, is a filing declaration of assets. Uh, he is elected. Uh, Ilham Aliyev is neither of oh, those. He does not file his uh, asset declaration. He does not, uh, he's, he's not feeling responsible for uh, talking about corruption or fighting corruption. He is not uh, uh, doing his job. And he is basically, he's there uh, sitting on his uh, seat, which is stolen, uh, which uh, he's secured his seat uh, thanks to stolen votes from people. So uh, it's a shame that Europe welcomed these politicians. And it's a shame that, and I think the words should follow with actions. And those who are uh, harassing civil society and limit freedoms in this country, steal people's money, should not be welcome. And they should face visa sanctions and other kind of sanctions in your countries. Thank you. Khadija, I would like to go back a few steps. So when did you first think that you would become a journalist and why? Um, it was an accident, actually. I, uh, I, I started working in the newspaper as a translator. Uh, so then, I, uh, then they sent me to, this, to follow the story and said, so, but there were people who inspired me, and uh, it was a woman journalist, Saladin Askerova, who died in the war, and I was, 
and we were and she basically she broke the wall saying that uh, showing that a woman can be professional and even sacrifice her life uh, while covering the war and that was one of the uh, walls that was broken before me and then uh, another uh, another step was when Elmar Hussein of the journalist investigative journalist and editor of monitor magazine had been killed in front of his door uh, with five bullets in his mouth it was 2005 and uh, the main topic of his uh, stories was corruption of the president's family uh, this president and his father, the previous president, he, he was writing about them. And uh, when he died, I felt guilty because uh, he was all alone in that field. And by silencing him, by killing him, they solved the problem for several years. For several years, there, were, there was a silence because there was no one else in the field. Uh, and uh, we left him alone. We were doing these easy stories, easy reporting, while he was hitting the, uh, the hard uh, ground and uh, digging the hard ground. So uh, that was a key moment, I think, when I decided to be an investigative journalist. And uh, that required skills. So for a few years I tried to build them and uh, I want to thank everyone who helped me to build those skills uh, because uh, journalism is not only the courage and curiosity it's also about skills and uh, uh, I want to thank OCCRP and all my trainers who uh, who helped me to become one and And certainly, Khadija, it is not only about skills, it is definitely also about courage, seeing that example of your colleague being murdered and you stepped into his shoes to continue this work. What did you discover when you started to investigate? Well, uh, one of the first stories was about the bank, uh, the state-owned bank privatized by president's daughter and uh, uh, another state official's wife. So uh, we did the story together with my colleague and we proved that the bank was privatized illegally. It was not just a uh, president's daughter joining the business, it was also illegal privatization. Uh, so um, this was uh, one of the first stories. And then we started digging further. We uncovered number of uh, businesses owned by officials and their uh, relatives uh, the, they enjoyed public procurement contracts uh, and uh, they've been basically granting public money to their relatives, to their wives, sons, brothers, and so on. And then while digging one of the stories, I needed an access to Panamanian database and my trainers showed how to do that. And uh, there I found 11 companies of president's daughters uh, some of them had been used to uh, hide their interests be beh behind uh, businesses in telecommunication, gold mining, uh, banking, construction holdings, and so on. So, uh, so it was 2011 and uh, Panama Papers had not been leaked yet. And I uncovered this, uh, uh, the gold source of in information about where the Azerbaijani money had gone. And, uh, um, and this Panama papers of mine helped to uncover uh, a lot of stories, corruption stories, but also, uh, also uh, there was a price to pay. And uh, after a few days after the first uh, story on Panama, companies of president's daughters just a few days after uh, there was the camera was planted in my bedroom so uh, we found out about it later when we uh, when I when it, the footage had been used against me and uh, I've been blackmailed and uh, then I investigated how the 
how and when the uh, the camera had been planted, and it turned out that it it was planted uh, basically a few days after the first Panama story. So it made them angry, and uh, I understand that uh, it will uh, have big. It had a reason uh, why they became angry because they have hidden a lot of assets be behind this offshore companies, and they uh, and they were angry that someone uncovered it. And it was so bold. They the companies had been registered on the name of daughters, not lawyers, not uh, representative, on their own names uh, because. For two reasons, the family does not trust others uh, because when you are hiding your money behind the other names, you have to trust them. So they have problem of trust inside the uh, the inner circle. And second reason was that they were bold enough because they were sure that nobody is going to uncover. And uh, I think uh, I think uh, these stories helped to for society to understand two things. First, uh, whatever you hide will be uncovered. Second, there was a myth in Azerbaijan that president is good and his entourage, his surrounding is bad. And uh, president doesn't know about corruption and that killed that myth. Uh, the stories killed that myth because it showed that uh, beneficiaries of corruption are the members of the president's family. Khadija, thank you so much. Thank you. You, con you continue to pay a very high price for alerting the world about these problems. And uh, we just had a discussion with Swedish parliamentarians and the other laureates over lunch where you see how this problem of corruption and of corrupt business deals, of course, is not at all confined to your country. It is something that we recognize in so many countries around the world. We look forward to seeing you again, hopefully, tonight. We uh, look forward to hearing more about your story. And please be assured that the whole family of Right Livelihood Award laureates will not rest until the situation in Azerbaijan improves and you are allowed to travel again. Thank you again for your work and for your courage. If I may, if I may just uh, one moment. Uh, the, um, the, the corruption is contagious and it doesn't stay in my country. Uh, corrupt money of my uh, country go to your countries, use, uh, are being used to buy services of European politicians. They corrupt your systems. And uh, one of my investigations was about the Swedish company, Telia Sonera, and their uh, dirty deals with the president's family. And hopefully, a justice to these cases will come earlier then these uh, corrupt leaders lose their life. We, we've seen the examples of Uzbekistan, Egypt, Zimbabwe, and others when the corrupt deals of the president's families have been uncovered, but too late after the president is losing its office or uh, because of the coup d'etat or dies. So let the justice bega begin before someone dies or loses the office. It should start while these people are in the office. And I hope Swedish uh, politicians, and this is the, uh, this is the uh, appeal, the call I want to make from this uh, stage. I hope Swedish politicians will do their best to achieve this international justice for corrupt cases, because it's not our internal issue here. It also poisons your countries. Thank you. And now I have the honor to introduce Robert Billot, our Right Livelihood Award Honorary Laureate this year. Robert is an environmental lawyer from the United States, and he receives the Right Livelihood Award for exposing a decades-long history of chemical pollution 
winning long sought justice for the victims and setting a precedent for effective regulation of hazardous substances. Robert Billet is one of the world's finest environmental lawyers. The American has achieved one of the most significant victories for environmental law and corporate accountability of this century. In a legal battle lasting 19 years, he represented 70,000 citizens whose drinking water had been contaminated by the chemical giant DuPont. At a time when environmental regulation is under serious threat of being watered down, Billet successfully won compensation for his clients and continues to call for better regulation of toxic substances. Robert Billet, USA. Welcome to Stockholm. Thank you. Glad Great to, to have you here. Delighted to be here. Is the microphone okay for everyone? Are you hearing well? No. <laughs> You've had a busy day already. You yes. were on Swedish radio this morning. You met the environment minister before we got here. What's your impression of meeting Swedish politicians and how we're dealing with these issues? Well, I, was, I have to say I was favorably impressed. I mean, after dealing with the U.S. system for the last 20 years, trying to get regulatory action on a class of chemicals that was fairly unregulated. Uh, it was nice to see, at least the people I've been talking to, understand the issue, understand the importance of taking action on the issue, and seem to be committed to addressing not just one chemical at a time, which has been what has been going on, at least in the United States over the last 30 years, but addressing all of these chemicals that are in our drinking water, particularly these fluorinated chemicals that I've been dealing with on a class-wide basis, all at once, so we don't have to be repeating what we went through in West Virginia and Ohio for every chemical every 30 years over and over. And it was glad to, I was very happy to hear that there was a real commitment to uh, addressing this on a, on a more comprehensive global scale, which is terrific. So let me rewind on your story a little bit also. You started as a lawyer working for commercial companies on environmental regulation, right? Correct. Yeah, I How did you end up uh, defending 70,000 victims of chemical pollution? Then? Well, I started my legal career in 1990 at a law firm in Cincinnati, Ohio, which was traditionally known as what you would call a defense law firm, representing big companies, including a lot of big international chemical companies. And so had trained for you know, eight, nine years in understanding the federal laws, the state laws, what, what the interests of the chemical companies are, and understanding and dealing with these issues. And in 1998, I got a call from a farmer in West Virginia um, who was telling me about cows that were dying on his property. And I wasn't quite sure what, what I was hearing on the other end of the line, but then he mentioned that he had been referred to me by my grandmother. And he was living in an area where my mother's family had grown up. So he said, I just want to show you the information I've got. I'm pretty sure I know where this is coming from, that my cows are being sickened by a, a, a runoff out of a landfill that's owned by the DuPont Company. Can I come show you this information? And so he did. He, we invited him up. He brought videotapes, photographs, and it was pretty compelling to see white, knee-high suds floating down a creek out of a big pipe labeled the DuPont Company. Um, so we thought this is something we could, we could assist on. But our law firm typically had been representing big companies who pay by the hour and pay fairly high rates, and this was clearly a family that could not do that. 
So it was the first time we took on a case for individuals where we agreed we would not charge them anything unless it was actually some sort of payment recovered for them in the end. And it was that case where we found out about this chemical that DuPont had been using, which was in the water that the cows were drinking, and ended up being in the entire community's water. And that became an incredible 18-year detective story for you, where in the beginning of this story, it wasn't even recognized that this chemical was toxic, right? You had to establish all the evidence along the way. Correct. What we found out was the landfill where these cows were, were drinking from, the water that was coming out of this landfill, um, was a place where the DuPont company had been dumping sludge from a Teflon manufacturing facility. The world's largest Teflon plant was right up the river along the Ohio River in West Virginia and had taken 7,000 tons of sludge contaminated with something called PFOA and had put in this landfill, which was then coming into this creek the cows were drinking. So we're starting to look into all these documents. We got into litigation with the company trying to find out what is this stuff called PFOA? Because even though I've been working on environmental issues for eight, nine years, I'd never heard of this chemical. So what we found, looking in the documents, this was one of these chemicals that predated environmental laws in the United States. It predated the existence of the EPA. It was something that had been developed right after World War II. So it had gone out into the market and was, was being used in a variety of different commercial products, including making Teflon and that the only information that seemed to exist was the company that made it, the 3M company, and the co one of the major customers, DuPont. They had been studying the toxicity of the chemical for decades. They knew it was causing all kinds of adverse effects in lab animals. They knew it was a carcinogen in lab animals by the 1980s. They had been doing studies on the workers. They knew it was getting into blood, and they even knew it was in the drinking water of the community. But they were the only ones who knew. But they were the only ones who knew. We, what we saw was they had not told the community, and importantly, they had not told the regulatory agencies. So we're looking through these documents and decide we need to let the agencies know what's going on here, because it looked like this was a chemical that had sort of sailed under the radar that nobody had really ever evaluated. And how, did the, how can we picture this literally? They had to force them to turn over boxes and boxes of documents. So you were, I've read in one article, you were like sitting on the floor of your office and you were the first one to discover what had been known by the company, but no one else knew about it. Yeah, this was the days before electronic documents. And so everything was coming in in paper. And we just had boxes and boxes of papers from the company, files in the 1950s and 60s. So I sat down and organized everything in chronological order and then started just reading through like a story and you could see what had been going on internally in this company for decades. Um, and it was just disturbing to see all of this information was known by, and you know, DuPont had one of the world's best scientific labs. So they were doing great work. It just wasn't being shared. But you informed the regulatory authorities. How did they react? <laughs> Uh, I was mentioning earlier today that this was one of the times I felt like I, I, when you look back, you realize how naive you might have been at the time. Uh, I had taken all this information and thought, well, it looks pretty obvious to me, looking at these documents, what's going on here and what needs to be done. There needs to be a, a limit set. DuPont had set its own limit for how much should be in the drinking water, and the levels in the community were three or four times over that. So I figured I'd just send this to the EPA, the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Once they look at all these documents, surely they'll say, see the same thing and they'll come in and regulate this. That was the year, that was March 6 of 2001. And as we sit here today, the chemical is still not regulated in the United States. The process has just now started to begin. So we had to pursue legal action to to get clean water, to get medical testing. Uh, if we had waited for the regulatory action, we would still be waiting. But you managed to get the toxicological testing of 70,000 people to get compensation for the victims. What was the key to that success? Uh, we brought a, a class action against DuPont in 2001, which was basically bringing a lawsuit against DuPont on behalf of the whole community saying, they all should get clean water and they all should get medical testing. Uh, that litigation went on for several years and we eventually sat down with the company 
and worked out an agreement where the company would, uh, with us, agree to set up independent scientific panels. We would take it out of the legal system because the legal system just wasn't fitting this situation. We had to create a new mechanism. So we put together independent scientific panels to look at all of the existing data and most importantly, to study the people that had never been studied, the community people that were drinking this in their water. And there were about 70,000 people. Money was set aside to have those people come in and provide blood samples, medical information, questionnaires, and it became one of the biggest human health studies ever done, which was important because you need a big enough group to find some of these rare cancers and health effects. Uh, and that took several years. And what can the world learn from this case when it comes to regulation of chemicals uh, in societies? We know that uh, I think we all have these substances in our blood, but not just these substances. We have tens of thousands of chemicals that we're exposed to. What does this story tell us about how chemicals ought to be regulated? Well, it, it was, in fact, this particular situation was used in the United States as a perfect example of why the, the, the laws and regulations, at least in our country, needed to be changed. And there needed to be more information provided up front when these chemicals are actually first going out into use about what they can do, what are the potential health effects, as opposed to what had been going on in a still pretty much the rule in the United States that the chemical is approved and then it's up to the people drinking it or who have been exposed to then have to prove it's harmful, and which is an extremely difficult process. So we're hoping to see the shift now to getting the information up front first Before you have people that are drinking it for decades, developing cancers, you shouldn't have to wait for people to get sick before you can prove a chemical shouldn't be on the market. Rob, please stay with us uh, here in the front. We want to continue the discussion with okay. other laureates also. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and success. And uh, it is now my immense pleasure to introduce Colin Gonsalves, lawyer from India, who receives the Right Livelihood Award for his tireless and innovative use of public interest litigation over three decades to secure fundamental human rights for India's most marginalized and vulnerable citizens. Colin Gonsalves is amongst the most complete human rights lawyers of his generation. He is a senior advocate at the Supreme Court of India and the founder of the Human Rights Law Network, an Indian national network of public interest lawyers. Over three decades, Human Rights Law Network's lawyers have engaged in public interest litigation to hold the government to account and secure a broad spectrum of human rights. Gonsalves' clients have included India's most vulnerable people, such as bonded laborers, ethnic and religious minorities, refugees, slum dwellers, women and the poor. Colin Gonsalves, India. Colin, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ole. Someone asked me, why are we giving this award to a bunch of lawyers this year? And, um, and I can ask you, as someone who wants to change society, why become a lawyer? Well, because the legal system in India is a bit uh, different from the legal system in Europe and America, or Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Lawyers play a very limited role in Western democracies. We have in our constitution and in our constitutional law 
a very unique, a very revolutionary kind of uh, development, which is called public interest litigation, which is like a class action case, which is very easy to do. So very cheaply, you can take a case on behalf of 10,000 people, a million people. The right to food case was on behalf of 350 million people. What and happened can, there? What was the right to food case? Well, it changed the situation in India. We had starvation deaths in the late 90s, early 2000. And it was so routine to see on television people dying because they hadn't eaten for days, children dying because they hadn't eaten. You would hear stories of, you know, widows saying, I fed my husband, I gave him water to drink, we had no food to eat. I gave him water to drink the second day, the third day. And then I just couldn't give him food and he died of starvation. In a country which has a 7% rate of growth of GDP, one of the most powerful economic nations in the world would have 50% today, 50% of the population below a poverty line of a dollar a day and 70% below $2 a day, 750 million people below a poverty line of $2 a day. Can you imagine a country like India, such a powerful country with the, perhaps the second largest standing army in the world after China, nuclear weapons, all kind of grand you know, programs, but 750 million people live in abject poverty and we use the legal system to combat against the government. Yeah, law the no is not the just normal uh, answer is uh, to run development programs, yeah. to do rural development, economic yeah. development. Yeah. What, what is the legal intervention and how did that work? Yeah. Look, when you do charity, particularly in developing countries, particularly in a country like India, all that money goes into a black hole and disappears. But when you teach people to fight for their rights, when you teach people to enforce the law, to engage in combat, and I would like to say very militant combat against despotic governments, like the Indian government is today. When you teach people that they have the power to change the world through the medium of the law and otherwise by struggle, that's an equally important way of changing things. Law and struggle, when you teach people that, then it's a thousand, thousand times better than charity because they empower themselves. Rob, do you have a question as a lawyer to uh, the work that you've heard uh, Colin yeah, doing in India? It's fascinating to me the, the ability you mentioned in India to have these massive actions against the government, right? Is that what you were saying? Yeah. You can actually have millions of people bringing claims against the government. Yeah. So, um, it is, how would you be able to do that without that kind of ability? I mean, without being able to sue the government. Like in the United States, we are prohibited from suing the government unless they invite you, essentially, to sue them. Yeah. Well, if I didn't have public interest litigation, if I didn't have my constitution and my courts, and if I didn't have the hundreds and hundreds of judgments that people have won from our courts on public interest litigation on behalf of the poor, I don't think I would be staying in my country. I would run away a long time ago. <laughs> I would like you to know that there are two Indias. One is the India that you would normally see of beautiful castles and you know, all the pomp and splendor, the culture, you know, the beautiful dances and all that. We have a phrase for that in India and it's called Maya or illusion. And I would like all of you members of parliament, if ever you come to India, you go with the government officials and see the Maya because it's beautiful to see. The music is beautiful, the dance is beautiful, and you'll see all the right places. But take a little time off and come with us and see the real India. The real India, which is very anti-Muslim. 40 persons in the last one year have been lynched, Muslims, because they eat beef. Can you imagine? Journalists have been killed because they write against the government and corruption. Right to information activists have been shot dead because they asked for information about corruption. And I told you about hunger and poverty in my country. 
So I would like you all to spend a little bit of time with the other side and see the other India when you visit. But then you do say that as a lawyer, you have legal remedies to take action on behalf of many people and in the, the name of public interest that, for instance, in the United States doesn't exist. So there's something in, in your work and in the Indian legal system that other uh, jurisprudences could learn of. Yeah, it's, it's very simple to explain. We recognize collective rights as opposed to individual rights. In Sweden, in the whole of Europe, in America, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, you recognize individual rights. You can't take a case easily on behalf of millions of people on food, education, housing. You can't do that, education. You can't do that. It's always individual rights and collective rights are not recognized. We recognize collective rights. And we've opened the doors of the court. The judges have opened the doors of the court so that any poor person can come into the court and get justice. A person who could not normally even get the bus fare to visit a lawyer, we can access justice through public interest lawyers. It's an extraordinary system. But I must say, it's not just India. It's Nepal, it's Pakistan. In South America, many countries have started using the public interest system. In Colombia, it's called the tutela system. Mexico uses a variant of the public interest system. So I want to say that the Western system is, ex is actually a minority system. But it's in the world, it's recognized as if it is the system, the only system possible. But we are the majority system. Many countries with constitutions in Africa, South America, Asia, are using public interest class action petitions to have access to justice for the poor. We are the center, but we are seen as the perimeter. And the Western systems, which are really so little bit backward, you might say, timid, conservative, they are seen in the world as the only possible system of law. This time, time has come, really, to change that situation. So what would a judge in the US tell you if you went to court invoking collective rights? That would be an interesting conversation. But <laughs> you know, in the United States, you have class actions. But typically, that has to be something where you can show that there's no difference between the people, and they're seeking the exact same thing. Um, and it's, it's become very, very difficult to pursue class actions in the United States. So. Uh, I've been thinking about things, for example, with the situation I'm dealing with, with these perfluorochemicals that are now in everyone's blood across the world. And in the United States, you really can't address that issue very effectively. But something like you just described, you know, I'm sitting here thinking about that, that would be a very interesting way to approach that, you know, sh should this be in everyone's blood? And is there, in fact, a way that can be addressed through something like you mentioned? That's fascinating. Uh, a conversation to be continued, but we will enrich it even more now. Um, and it is my huge pleasure to introduce Yetnevers Nigusi from Ethiopia, who receives the Right Level Award this year for her inspiring work promoting the rights and inclusion of people with disabilities, allowing them to realize their full potential and changing mindsets in our societies. Yetnabersh Negusi is an Ethiopian lawyer working for human rights. She's fearlessly pushing for women's and girls' rights, inclusive education, and a vibrant civil society. Negusi is an outstanding advocate for the rights enshrined in the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Through her tireless efforts, she has changed perceptions on disability with the compelling message, focus on the person, not the disability. We have one disability, but 99 abilities to build on. 
Ngozi fights for the inclusion of the 15%, about 1 billion, of the world's population who have some kind of disability. She strives to create inclusive conditions for future generations. Yet Nabersh Ngozi, Ethiopia. Welcome to Stockholm. Thank you. Has Sweden been nice to you so far? Yes. <laughs> You've had a busy time already, huh? Yes. And uh, in general, you're, you're traveling a lot these days. You work for an Austrian organization. I remember when we announced the award, you were in London. Yeah, I think uh, disability is a global phenomenon, so wherever you are, you can talk about it. The link with an organization in Austria, you, know, you started your work in Ethiopia. You founded or co-founded an organization which you built up over the last 10 years, but you've now moved on to work for an organization uh, tackling these issues globally, right? Yes. Yeah, um, I, I um, um, well, disability is my 24-7 job, so I don't quit at 5.30. Uh, <laughs> When I am in a bar, when I am in a church, even on a Sunday, I have to struggle with attitudes about disability. When I am uh, uh, sleeping, I sometimes dream about it, so I am 24-7 into it. Yeah, I, 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 I co-founded the Ethiopian Center for Disability and Development to uh, strive for the inclusion of persons with disabilities uh, instead of segregated services for persons with disabilities and uh, learning strong cases and lessons uh, from Ethiopia, I uh, have also seen that we share a lot of uh, uh, barriers, we share a lot of uh, challenges globally together. So I thought uh, my uh, strong local lessons can be of benefit for the global disability movements. Uh, and uh, the same, like if you go to India, we were talking yesterday, we, ha we shared the same problems with Indians with disabilities. If you come to Sweden, where I have started my early disability activism, we do share the same challenge. So I thought it's important to spend more time on the global and regional level advocacy. So I collaborate with Light for the World, now uh, working in Africa as well as at the UN level. And how different is the situation from country to country? You say it's the same challenges everywhere. Um, there are differences that we shouldn't deny. In uh, developing countries like mine, Ethiopia, where poverty is the main characteristics of disability, then uh, there are a lot of competing priorities. So to be visible in the eyes of the parliamentarians, having a disability is not the best option. So there are other politically gainful, strong movements, empowered movements, uh, which are mostly visible. So disability uh, stands to be highly sympathetic, but not uh, purely of development and accountability agenda. Whereas in countries, in developed countries, where there are better systems, like uh, where there are better representations of persons with disabilities in the politics, where they have both the walk the talk and the check, which is the money together to do, to do disability activities, then changes are much faster there. And what is that the key for that change to happen? You talk about policies, you also talk about attitudes in society. Where is the, the root of the problem and how do you tackle it? Uh, that's a, a very tricky question uh, and it requires a bit of geological knowledge for uh, 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 digging deep into the issue. I would like to come back to what you have been talking with Colin. Uh, becoming a lawyer has taught me that it's not because people do not have money that we persons with disabilities are not getting enough of our share, rather there is inequality and inequitability in unfair distribution of wealth. So I believe uh, and I have witnessed that uh, lack of equity, lack of equality contributes a lot to where we are. 
And uh, as Khadija mentioned very well, uh, uh, injustice somewhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And injustice for persons with disabilities is a, a threat for justice for all persons, even, even including those with dis without disabilities. So I would say uh, the root causes are mainly ignorance and lack of education and lack of awareness and lack of solution how to do it. So I would say the mindsets are the most inaccessible places to navigate. Maybe it's easier with a wheelchair to navigate the, the buildings with the stairs because you can be supported with people, but the inaccessible mindsets are too difficult to access. Yes, Andesh, can I ask you a question, or rather something that you can speak to our audience? Last night you spoke of very crazy laws in Ethiopia for disabled persons, the huge hurdles you have to overcome uh, in these laws. Can you say a few words about that? Hmm. Uh, joining this Family of Rights Livelihood Award is another inspiration as well as another more sleepless nights you will have. So we had a discussion. So in my country, Ethiopia, where I am today being recognized for bringing a lot of change, we still face a lot of discriminations as persons with disabilities. One example is that deaf people cannot drive cars in Ethiopia. And recently this question was brought to our minister and he said, yes, we want to protect them. And imagine a protection that you cannot drive your own car, but you're protected, okay? And uh, 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 Colin, you were telling me an interesting case of the same by uh, your organization that you want to share maybe for our audience. Well, I'd rather you speak. We got an order saying that deaf people can drive. The Delhi High Court recently gave judgment that there's no reason why a deaf person can't drive. And I think deaf people in Sweden can also drive. You can also get a driving license in Sweden, I'm told. I'm not sure, but it can be done. But we must tell them about how a person like you can never become a judge. Yes, and uh, uh, another discrimination that we have is that a blind person cannot be a judge because they do think that the first thing you want to become a judge is an I. <laughs> so I don't think they wars the, all the law school trainings that we receive. We never had a medical visual acuity test when we were, went to law school, but when we graduate, that we were told that we cannot compete for a position to become judges as blind people. So this and other systematic discriminations still exist from undermining our abilities and uh, 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 capitalizing on our disabilities. The same for banking, that I am not allowed to sign checks in Ethiopia, where uh, I am a citizen, but I, I can sign uh, uh, my own bank account in uh, Austria, where I am working uh, partly now uh, with Light for the World. So you, you, the same like for if you have an intellectual disability, you cannot inherit a property of your parents your intellectual disability is considered as a failure and you are not legally capable, you're considered legally incapable to inherit a property of your parents. So this and other discriminations, which uh, sound very, very small, are very dehumanizing and de 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 dis disabling by themselves, I would say. What can everyone individually do about this? You know, how can we as members of society contribute to changing attitudes? Ah, that's a very good question because it's always my belief that everyone has a role in changing this scenario. Um, the first thing I want to share with you is like, for example, 96% of children with disabilities in my country are not yet to school. This figure is the sexist figure for Ethiopia, where they say 96% of their children are in school, and I tell them minus 15, because 15% of them are children with disabilities. 96 is a good number when it's for success, but 96 for exclusion is a very painful number. And uh, I, I do think uh, that, uh, for example, development partners like CEDA, they do finance a lot of things in my country, as well as in quite so many countries. How many of our development partners do worry about whether their money is building a new barrier or not? New schools built by development partners, including EU, do not have access for children using welter. 
They do not have access for children with crutches. They do not have alternative communication tools for those with communication disabilities. So making sure that we use our money to build a better future for all. And for all, it should be really for all. I believe the best place to, to end, to combat any inequality is inclusive and quality education. Educate your children, educate those with disabilities in an inclusive setting where they will play and grow together. That way they will not become apart when they are old and when they're adult. And then that will be a hope for an inclusive society. Yeah, Nabar, thank you so much. We are so deeply impressed by your work and we would like to continue this discussion with two members of the Swedish parliament, Margareta Sederfeldt and Anders Österberg. Please join us and squeeze uh, with us here so you get access to the microphones. Welcome. <laughs> Margareta Sederfeldt is a member of parliament for the moderate party. You've been active in local politics in Stockholm and uh, you are a senior member of the Swedish parliament, having been a member of the uh, traffic committee, the constitutional committee, committee of civil affairs, but now you are a member of the foreign affairs committee. You've also started a cross-party network called the Forum for Inventions and Innovations, I read on the internet. And Anders, you are a member of the Social Democratic Party, so we see here with you two the breadth of the political support that uh, the Right Livelihood Award enjoys in the Swedish Parliament. You're a member also of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, and uh, I read some of your very interesting op-ed articles when preparing for this moderation on Israel-Palestine, on Russia, LGBT issues in Chechnya, let me ask both of you, you know, does this discussion, does that reflect discussions you have on the Foreign Affairs Committee? Uh, how do you react to what you hear from our laureates? Thank you very much. Ola, yes, the microphone is on. Well, first of all, I would say that I am very impressed of the voters here because they have shown a lot of courage. Uh, also, accountability and to look forward to identify a problem, but not accept it, to try to solve it and move forward. And hold on, even if it's personal struggle. And also build network, because you can't do any changes if you stand alone. You need to collaborate with other people. And, uh, well, I must say also that I think this is very important to us in the Committee on Foreign Affairs and also as a politician with other international duties to be aware of that the world is not the same everywhere. There are different kind of problems, but there is also different ways to find a solution. And we have to recognize that and to support, but also to try to connect with people who move forward to see possibilities. And of course, I do have also had a reflection when I listen to the panel, is the importance to have a society where there is a, the power is divided. It's not concentrated that the government, the parliament, and also the public institutions are divided from each other. And th where there is a society where it's po possible to scrutinize all those institutions and an openness where the documents are public. Mm. So everyone can find out what's happening, who is the how is the decision made, and uh, follow up 
that this is correct. And of course, a law that protects the most vulnerable people, as well as a law who is in favor of meeting freedom of speech and so on. That's what some of my reflections. Floris, your reactions to that? I'll start. <laughs> um, I, I, I would agree. I mean, one of the things I think we saw uh, in our litigation, the experience we had in the United States was, you know, we still have, at least in our, in our community, the ability of one individual to go up against a, hum a huge multinational corporation with very strong connections at every level of government within the scientific community, within the political realm, within the economic realm, and still be able to go up against that company and be uh, on an equal basis. Um, and one of the things that we found to be the most important, and one of the things that I was um, particularly interested to hear the discussion about the, the you know, re repression of the journalists and the media was, it was so critically important that information be made available to the public, be freely accessible, and that things that were hidden in corporate files or in government files, that once that became available, particularly with the rise of non-governmental organizations that were able to post things online, it was just a completely liberating thing. You know, to have the information available, people were suddenly on an equal footing with each other. Uh, Madam Minister, I, uh, I would like to react to your speech generally. And I must say that you stand here today and you encourage us and you support us is for me a very big thing. I don't think in my country I could step in front of parliament and do a discussion on human rights. It's never happened for a long, long time. And uh, it's so strange that the largest democracy in the world has adopted practices that are so restrictive, and I spoke of only a few. But I heard you over lunch, and I saw you here today, and you speak as a senior person from the parliamentary system, and you spoke of transparency and support for human rights and the, the Right Livelihood Award. To me, it's quite, a, it's a quite a wonderful feeling that I get. And I must tell you, in my country, Sweden is seen with a great deal of respect from human rights activists. There are many countries in the developed world, I don't want to mention them here, but they are not so respected because they side with the government against the people. They side with our government against our people. But Sweden has always had a very gentle side, a very democratic side. And when things have happened that were not good, uh, your government people spoke kindly and supported us in our struggles. So I want to thank you very much, just for your presence and your words today. Yeah. Maybe I just want to highlight on the point that you mentioned uh, 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 about the, the need for law for protecting uh, the most vulnerable citizens, because rich people have their money to protect them, and laws are there to protect the most vulnerable ones. And uh, this is a critical point that we have to take away, I think, as you mentioned. And uh, unfortunately, a, a breach of right at certain point uh, brings about a breach of rights at every point. Like uh, uh, compromising the freedom of speech for journalists, uh, compromised access to information for the public. Actually, with this ban that Khadija has faced, it's not her who's banned, it's her, uh, it's her people who are banned from accessing the information they want to. So it's not her in jail, it's her people in jail. Even though they look, they're outside and they're going to shops, but they, they access the information. But when we talk about information, and uh, um, I think it's also important to think about alternative formats of information. Quite so many deaf people in, in a number of countries, including mine, do not have, yes, information. How accessible is it for all? How open is it for all? And one thing that we forget about is, governance and accountability is only labeled for some issues. Like for example, if a, if a person is denied the right to school, is it considered a governance right? And strong institutions, as you mentioned, the, 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 the division of power among different government institutions is critical 
but it's also important that we get people empowered to claim that, to demand that. We shouldn't wait for somebody from the West to come and tell us that you have to demand this. That's why we really need to uh, think about participation of those most vulnerable. And we have our known slogan, nothing about us without us. That is about making sure that uh, that we also participate in bringing the solution, as you mentioned, not only in creating or in only suffering from the problem. Thank you so much. And thank you for your very uh, eloquent reflection on, uh, on the accountability points. Anders, I would like to bring uh, you in um, to share your reflections and also maybe to uh, reflect on whether the very rosy image of uh, Sweden that our friend was painting here, if that is really so justified. Well, I belong to the government, so I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, the first thing I would say is that when I hear all about you and your stories, I'm thinking, what should I do if I were, were in your situation? And actually, I don't know. So I must say that I really admire your big bravery and your, also your results that you achieved. So thank you so much for what you have done for humanity so far. Uh, then, uh, actually, I have um, some smaller reflections, not smaller in that way, but, for example, um, some months ago, we met uh, like 36 uh, parliamentarians from India, uh, here in Sweden. All of them were men. And then, actually, my comrade here from the Conservative Party, she looked at me, you know, and I immediately know what to do. So I raised my hand and asked, why is there no women from India who wants to come to Sweden? And you know, I think that's so amazing because since we are from different parties, we are agreeing that human rights, women rights, everyone's rights are so important. And of course, I looked back on her and she just nicked at me and said, how about gay rights in India? And that's the same because Margarita and me, we have been in Moldova, we've been in Afghanistan, and you know, all the time we are agreeing. And I think that's very nice that we agree on the most important things. And we are not agree about some other things, but that's a good thing that not, we should not. Uh. And the other thing that uh, I would say also that when we're going to meet representatives from Ethiopia, of course we will bring up the question of disabilities. I didn't know about that. And I am sure that you also will raise that up when we meet them. Of course we'll do that because uh, I, uh, I am really regret that we didn't know about this because then we'd done it earlier. And I don't know if we are going to meet the Trump administration. <laughs> <laughs> but I also have a question. That is, now you're here today and uh, having this award, what are you going to do tomorrow when you're back in your business? Yes. Um, I am continuing to work on the same issue. Um, the chemicals that I've been dealing with are now, we, we're, we're we're getting an increasing knowledge of how many there are. There seems to grow every day in the locations across not just the United States, but across the world. Um, the number of communities that are dealing with this and the number of governments that are trying to understand what to do to address the issue. Um, it's an expanding problem. Um, I have still millions of children uh, uh, who are out of school. And I have still back in my country, quite a lot of children with disabilities chained in fear of heat and in fear of shame and stigma by their families. So I will continue running in the village in Ethiopia, in Burkina Faso, Mozambique and elsewhere to make sure that all children are equally valued despite the disabilities they have. I believe I came first before my disability. So I would work to open the eyes of the society to see my, uh, my and other people's hundreds of abilities uh, and not to be overshadowed by our disability. So I suppose like all of us, we will continue doing what we've done for so long. And uh, the more difficult it, the times become, as in India today, the more difficult it becomes, the more resolute we become in fighting against uh, injustice and so on. As far as you are a member of the government, I would like to 
say one little suggestion, that you do very good business with India, and I feel happy for that. Even though I oppose the government on human rights issues, I'm happy if India becomes part of the global world order and becomes strong and powerful and proud of the work that it does. But in that relationship, sometimes what happens is issues relating to human rights are sometimes sidestepped. And I don't mean Sweden, I mean generally in the world. The developed world will sidestep the tricky issue and say we want to build a relationship so we don't talk of the negative things. And that's very bad for us. And I would request that you tell all your colleagues in the developed world that when they come to India, talk about business, do good business, but also say that we don't agree with this, we don't agree with this, kindly change this. And I'm glad you brought up this thing about women because discrimination against women in my country is so much. In the Supreme Court, we have 30 judges and one woman. <laughs> So please raise these issues, and I think when you raise it, suddenly India says, oh, countries are talking about us. And you have a very important role. You can change the mindset of politicians when you raise issues relating to human rights. Um, I would just like to say, uh, I would just like I would just, I don't know what's happening here. Now it works. I would just like to say two things. First of all, we can never take democracy and the situation we have today in Sweden for granted. Nowhere. It's not possible. And then the second thing is thank you very much for your very good and important work. And please continue what you do. Thank you. We still have three, four more minutes. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh. If you want to address another question or reflection at the Lauritz. Yes, of course, we have hundreds of questions. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I can continue with the uh, India track. Uh, I'm actually wondering how you can reach all over the country with information about according to human rights. How is it possible because the country is, you know, it's bigger than Europe. How do, you, how do you manage to raise people up the knowledge? It's a very big country, but with 1,200 million people. And if you look at the activists and the social workers and the NGOs and civil society organizations and the indigenous people's organizations, there are millions of people in our country who are very socially aware. They don't have a a school qualification, they don't have stomach, you know, they don't have food in their stomachs, but they're very socially conscious about how they'd like India to go forward. And social ideas spread through the country. We play a small role, but many NGOs are very active, and they spread ideas of liberation, of equality, of secularism. They spread these ideas throughout the country. So you're right, it's a very big country, we don't have access to, generally, the movements don't have access to television and newspapers because they're owned by corporations today. But we have our own methods of communication and we work very hard. Everybody works every Saturday, every Sunday. People travel out to remote areas. And it's truly a spiritual kind of experience. When you come to India, we'd like to share some of that with you. It's a spiritual experience about how people who don't have resources really spend their lives trying to change India to make it a better country. Any more reflection from you, Margareta? Yes, I have one reflection, but that, that's actually for Kadia, who is not up here but on her, the But actually floor. her colleague, Emin, is here. Yes. And what I thought about uh, when I heard her, her speech, it was 
how is it to be a journalist, to get the information, to struggle on, to get, try to get all her articles published, and probably be rejected, but then continue to find new newspapers, and meeting the violence, but continue to find papers. And uh, I would like to hear a little bit about that, because I see it as a very important issue with free journalism and also the free uh, news media to get things published. So Khadija Ismailova is represented during the program in Stockholm here by Emin Mili, who will receive the award on her behalf tonight. Please, Emin, come up and uh, answer the question. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, can you repeat, please, the question so I can understand it? Yes, thanks. Uh, my question was that uh, when we saw uh, Kajia here on the movie, she uh, talked about uh, how she worked and uh, all the resistance. But it's also a work she do where she struggled to get the information, to find the sources. Of course, people are frightened to talk with her because they don't also know what kind of uh, punishment they might get. And of course, try to publish her articles. There might be not any media in Azerbaijan who would like to publish it. And if they publish, they will be closed down. On the same when it's on internet. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think it's so important to know how is it to work as a journalist and how is it also to be a person to try to give information? Because that's also a problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, living you know, in 21st century, even you know, in Martin Luther's time, when he wanted to spread a message, when it was very difficult to spread the message, he managed to spread it pretty well. I mean, there was a con consequence, a lot of violence, uh, you know, for decades, centuries. Um, but in 21st century, um, nothing really changed. If, if you are telling the truth, if you have information that people and society find uh, interesting and useful, um, you can spread it. Uh, I can um, give you an example. Khadija works with OCCRP, which is network of uh, worldwide network of uh, investigative journalists. So she has a lot of colleagues abroad who help her to investigate the story, especially you know outside of Azerbaijan, to check the sources, to 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 look at some data and so on. Um, but also. Um, uh, she works for uh, uh, Radio Liberty, uh, and uh, it was always published uh, by Radio uh, Liberty, uh, Azerbaijani service. Uh, I'm running personally Maidan TV. Um, it is independent online media for Azerbaijan, so it was, we founded it five years ago in Berlin, in Germany. Uh, our website is blocked now, but despite of this, we uh, doubled our audience every year uh, since five years, and today we are reaching out to 10% of the entire population of Azerbaijan, despite of the fact that our website is blocked. So, uh, and of course we are publishing Khadija's investigations as well. Uh, so my point is, yes, it is difficult, uh, but uh, there is no limit uh, in terms of uh, being able to publish you know, what you have investigated in social media, in not so many uh, independent media outlets that left. Uh, but the paradox of closed societies is that the more closed society becomes, the less independent media you have, the less people who tell the truth you have. Paradoxically, actually, the wider outreach this free information is getting, because this white noise is neutralized, it's just not there, very few people have courage like Khadija to talk, to investigate, to publish. And then it becomes a rare commodity. It's almost like a market, uh, you know, uh, rules. And it becomes a very rare commodity and people are very attracted to this, uh, 
for example, reporting that Khadija, I know in Azerbaijan when she's publishing report on uh, what has president or his daughters uh, behind which industry or bank or uh, gold mine they are standing, everyone, even in the most remote villages, people start talking, you know, about this. So, yes, it is difficult, but, you know, the, no dictatorship, no country in the world has managed so far to stop this. Thank you very much for these... Thank you for these hopeful words. And before we wrap up, I would just like to ask Colin Yetnebarish and Rob to share with us the one thought, briefly, that you would want us to take with us from this afternoon. What is the idea that you want the audience to take with them going from here? Well, the only thing that I'd like to say, and something we cherish, is solidarity across borders. And if the Swedish people and its parliamentarians and its leaders interact with the people and the people's movements in India, that would strengthen us enormously. Solidarity across borders. Uh, my message for the seminar uh, participants this afternoon is that we all belong to one planet, so don't leave us into segregated services. Get us into one classrooms with all other children. Get us into one office with all other employees. Get us into one parliament with all others who had already voted. So uh, just focus and invest in our abilities. Do not forget our disabilities, but let's work together to overcome our barriers. Thank you so much. I think you know, from what my experience has been, an individual in a community, it can, as long as they're persistent, they can make a difference. As long as they stay focused, whatever they want to do, it can be done as long as you're persistent and keep on doing what you think is the right thing to do. You can make a change, and it can happen. Uh, just stay focused and, and keep working on, your, on the goal, and it doesn't matter if you're one person, a small community. You can do whatever needs to be done as long as you stay focused and persistent and dedicated to doing the right thing. Thank you so much for those beautiful final words. Thank you, laureates, panelists. Special thanks to Margareta and Anders and to Emin for speaking on Khadija's behalf. Thank you very much. And uh, over to you, yeah. Cecilia. Thank you, Ole. Dear laureates, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for sharing a few moments together with us. And Right Livelihood, thank you so much. On behalf of Sala in the Swedish Parliament, I will say thank you to you that organized this seminar for us. To, um, I think it was Mr. Gonzalez who said that humanity is sidestepped, but now we have put uh, humanity in front and uh, in front of all of us. And um, I hope you, as I am very inspired of the courage you have shared with us and that we could um, go out from here and um, think we all could do something to make this world a better one. And thank you so much for your sharing this afternoon and good luck. And thank you for coming, all of you. And at last, I would like, you know, a seminar as this is not made by itself. And Ole have already uh, thanked Evalena Johnson 
our chair of the Sala so much for her contribution. But there is also administrative personnel and in the Social Democrat administration is one lovely person who is called Petra Dahlberg and we like to thank her for all her efforts for arranging this seminar. Thank you all for coming.